baby yo what's up g fan this is gifted here and welcome back to another episode another review another reaction guys today we're gonna be reacting to mr bond in top three places you can go and people who went anyways part 25 all right boys let's get it you guys already know mr bond and he's freaking fantastic so we're gonna be checking him out but before we press that juicy play button guys if you're new to my channel i welcome you to my channel if you consider subscribing it would be amazing let's get it boys <coughs> Part of my cough. I pre been a little under the weather, but we're getting better, boys. We're getting better. Got this open and ready. <coughs> we're gonna go ahead and hit it with a thumbs up. Bam! Because it helps with the YouTube algorithm, boys. And let's get it. Today we're gonna look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious- Yes, we are, Mr. Bowen. Yes, we are, right baby. Place, because that's all we do, and we upload two or three times every week. Yeah, baby. So if that's baby. interest to you, the next time the like button asks you to be a reference on their job application, say yes, and when the company calls you, proceed to tell them how unqualified and terrible the like button is. <laughs> also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all <laughs> notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. <laughs> all right, let's get into today's stories. Oh my god. I would never do that. On Friday, August 21st, 2020, 58-year-old Aristides Polino was driving back to his home in Miami, Florida in his police SUV after completing a midnight shift. Mm. Aristides was a 25-year veteran of the Miami police force, and over the last two plus decades, he had routinely done midnight shifts, so this was nothing new. When he got to his house, he parked his SUV in the driveway, and like always, he went right into his house. He didn't talk to his wife, Clara, or his son. He just went straight up to his bedroom and immediately fell asleep. About four hours later at 5 p.m., Aristides woke up and he expected to hear his wife's voice somewhere in the house. So when he didn't and the house was just totally silent, something told him that something was off. So he climbed out of bed, he put on his clothes, and he went downstairs to look for his wife. When he got down to the living room, he saw his son sitting on the couch, but he didn't see his wife. And so he asked his son, you know, hey, have you seen your mom? And he would say, no, I haven't seen her. But sensing on his dad's face that something was wrong, he said, hey, I'll help you look for mom. And so the two men began searching the house, yelling out for Clara, and Aristides began calling his wife, but she wasn't picking up. And after several minutes, the two men reconvened in the living room, and they started going over whether or not she had told them about some appointment that day, and that would explain why she wasn't in the house. House. But after talking about it, they decided that she didn't have any appointments and she should be home right now. And so the men decided, you know, maybe she went outside and she's talking to a neighbor or, you know, she went for a walk and she's talking to somebody on the road. And so they decided they would go outside and search the outside of the property. When they got outside, Aristides went towards the back of the property and his son went towards the front down towards the driveway. And so as Aristides is making his way around the back of the property, he hears his son scream out for help. Aristides comes running back on the property and he sees his son standing in the driveway with the door of his police SUV wide open. Four hours earlier, after Aristides came home, he parked his police SUV right in the driveway like he always did, and for some reason he left the car unlocked. And so he goes in the house and he falls asleep. And while he was sleeping, Clara, who was home, she exited the house and walked down the driveway to his SUV. She opened up the door and went inside. It's believed she was looking for something, although we don't know what she was looking for. And while she was in the back of his car, fishing around for whatever it was she was looking for, the door she had entered the vehicle in shut behind her. And because this is a police SUV, uh. the back seat was designated for suspects. And so the back two doors did not open from the inside. <clears throat> and there was a very thick partition separating the back seat from the front seat. So Clara could not just reach over the seats and honk the horn to get someone's attention. And Clara Clara did not have her cell phone, so she couldn't call anyone for help. And when she screamed out for help to somebody out on the road to help her, her screams were severely muffled, and the back windows of this police car were heavily tinted, making it extremely difficult to see that there was a person in the back seat of this car. So for four hours, Clara desperately screamed and kicked and punched and did everything she could to try to free herself from the situation she was in. All the while, the temperature inside the car continued to go up. The SUV was parked in full sunlight, no shade whatsoever, and the temperatures that day were over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And so by the time Clara was ultimately discovered, the inside of that SUV had effectively become an oven. Aristides ran over to his vehicle and he pulled his wife out and he started doing CPR on her, but it was too late. She had died of heat stroke. Her death oh, was ultimately no. ruled an accident. Dang. On May 22nd, 2021, a father and his young son were out for a walk in their small suburban town just outside of Barcelona, Spain. When they reached their downtown, they were going to turn around and walk back home, but the boy pleaded with his father to make a quick stop at the old theater. The reason the boy and many other kids in the town loved going to this old theater was because out front of it was this huge paper mache statue of a dinosaur, a stegosaurus to be exact. And so after a little bit of convincing, the father finally agrees and they start heading in that direction. After they turned the corner and could actually see the dinosaur statue, the boy took off running while the father just stayed back and walked leisurely watching his son the whole time. And as he's watching his son, he can see he gets right up to the statue and then the boy just kind of suddenly stops and stares at something on the bottom of the statue. And so the father notices his son has seen something peculiar enough to make him stop and stare. And so he yells to his son, hey, what do you see? And the son just points at the back right leg of the statue. And so the father thinks this is really weird, so he jumps dogs up to his son and he crouches down right next to him and looks in the direction his son is pointing. And at first, the father believes all his son is pointing at is this fairly obvious crack on the outside of the statue on the back right leg. And he's thinking his son has just noticed that the statue is kind of falling apart. But as he's looking at this crack that his son is pointing at, he realized his son was not pointing at the crack. He was pointing at what was behind the crack, what was inside the dinosaur statue. And when the father realized what he was looking at, he grabbed his son, stood up, and ran in the other direction and called emergency services. A few minutes later, the police and fire department show up in front of this old theater. They get out and they go up to the statue and they confirm what's inside this back right leg. Afterwards, they go to their trucks and they get out chainsaws. Eventually, they were able to carve a big enough square on this back right leg that they were able to remove the thing that the father and the son had seen originally, and that was a dead man's body. Not much is known about yeah. this dead man, except that he was a 39-year-old man who his family had reported missing a couple of days before he was actually found. While we don't know this for sure, Dang. it's believed he decided to crawl inside the statue when he realized the belly of the dinosaur was movable. Now, it's not entirely clear how he figured that out, Either the belly was already moved and he saw the opening and so saw the opportunity to crawl inside for some reason, or he was poking and prodding at the statue and discovered the belly was movable, moved it aside, and then again seized the opportunity and crawled inside. But either way, the man crawled inside the statue, and then once he was in the dinosaur, his phone slipped out of his hand or slipped out of his pocket, and then instead of falling out of the dinosaur onto the ground, it fell inside the dinosaur and slid down the inside of the statue until it fell into the bottom of the bottom right hand leg. And so the man decides to go after his phone and so on his belly he slides over to the back right leg and then he begins lowering himself head first into the leg reaching for Bruh, his phone. Geez. And so as he's kind of slowly lowering himself down using his legs to pin himself inside the statue, he, can't get back he gets out. closer and closer and he's almost about to grab his phone when his feet lose their grip and he slips and falls head first all the way to the bottom of this back right leg. The space he was in was so tight he was not able to turn himself around and climb up and out again. In fact, it was so tight he could barely move. His arms were pinned by his side and so he couldn't oh use them God. to even push himself back up and out. And because he could not bend his legs, he could not use his legs to pull himself back out again either. And so this man most likely began screaming for help, but for whatever reason, nobody heard him. And so after what must have been several agonizing days, the man finally just died. His oh. Autopsy oh, has not shit. been made public, so we don't know for sure what actually killed him, although one could speculate he died of either dehydration or perhaps asphyxia from being trapped in this really tight space where his chest may not have been able to expand all the way, and so he would have eventually suffocated. Dude, that's probably one of the worst deaths ever, to be honest. That's got to be one of the worst. Following oh the God. gruesome discovery, the dinosaur statue was removed from the front of the old theater. In the early 1980s, John Harder was the classic, athletic, popular kid at his high school in Delaware, Ohio, which is a relatively small town just outside of the state's capital. But unlike most stereotypes that paint high school jocks as being these total jerks that bully people and they're kind of stupid, right. John was none of those things. He was incredibly friendly and very warm-hearted and seemed to get along with everyone. 
John also was known for having a great sense of humor. In particular, he liked to play these kind of harmless pranks that would make people smile, like the time he very enthusiastically joined the cheerleaders during a high school pep rally, despite not actually being a cheerleader himself. John was set to graduate from high school on June 5th, 1983, and his plan was to study accounting at Kent State University the following year. A few weeks before his graduation, John's high school began selling these tickets to a grad night at a huge amusement park called King's Island. Kings Island was located about two hours west of John's high school, and it was home to dozens of roller coasters, water slides, and many other attractions. During their so-called grad nights, this amusement park would shut down their public operations and not let anybody into the park that did not have these special student tickets that they gave to local area high schools. Mm -hmm. John, who was 17 years old at the time, was very excited at the idea of going to this grad night, and so he went and purchased tickets along with about 20 other students from his high school. At about 3.30 p.m., on Friday, May 13th, John and the other students who had bought grad night tickets met up outside of their high school. While this was a school-sponsored trip, the students were responsible for driving themselves to the park. And so after all the students were accounted for, they all piled into a couple of their cars and they began their journey to the park. After a few stops along the way to get food and go to the bathroom, the students finally arrived at the park at about 7 p.m. And on the drive, John, who had been a passenger, had drank half a bottle of rum and about three to Dang. six beers. And so when he got out, he could barely stand, he was so drunk. And so the students made their way over to the front gate, they showed the attendant their grad night ticket, and they were allowed inside. And surprisingly, despite it being this special night where only people with these tickets were allowed in, it was still pretty crowded. There were lots of students that apparently wanted to come to this event. Once John and the rest of the students from the Delaware High School had come inside the park, there was no rule that they had to stick together for the duration of their time there. Right. And so they all kind of broke into their separate groups and went their separate ways. In John's particular group was his girlfriend, Pam. And for the first hour they were in the park together, all they did was bicker and fight. Onlookers would say, John looked visibly upset and very emotional and very drunk. By 8.30 p.m., when John's group had gotten in line for this roller coaster, John was now openly saying, I don't want to be here anymore, I just want to go home. It was pretty obvious he was still just mad at Pam, and that's why he was saying all this, was just trying to make Pam feel bad. And so some of the group members told John, just, hey man, calm down, you're overreacting, just try to enjoy this ride and then afterwards we'll get some food it'll be fine but it was pretty clear that john was really worked up and seemed incapable of having a good time at this point but regardless john and the rest of the group they got on this ride at about 9 p.m and then after the ride was over they disembarked and they walked away from the ride to regroup and figure out what was next and they're looking around and john is nowhere to be found and so after waiting for a few minutes and actually walking around looking for him they decided that you know what he was really upset before he got on this ride. He probably just wanted to walk away and be by himself for a bit. I'm sure we'll see him later in the night. So John's group, without John, just continued going around the park, going on different <coughs> rides. And for the next few hours, they kind of forgot about John. It wasn't until the end of the night when over the loudspeaker, the park officials said, okay, we're closing the park now, that they started walking out and wondering where John was. And they were convinced, you know what? I'm sure he's back at the cars. He's probably waiting for us because he just wants to go home. And so they leave the park, they get out to their cars in the lot, and John's not there. And so at this point, the group's starting to get a little bit concerned because no one knows where he is. They're meeting up with the other groups from their high school. No one's seen John. And so they're all just kind of staring at the front gate, waiting for John to come out, but he doesn't. And then eventually the lights in the park start shutting down and the security guard comes out front and locks the front gate. And that's when the group knew they had a problem. After an extensive investigation by police, this is their best guess as to what happened to John. After John and his small group rode that roller coaster around 9 p.m., John very quickly disembarked the ride before anybody else in his group could see him. And then John stumbled his way towards the replica Eiffel Tower that this park was famous for. This tower stood at about 300 feet tall and was built to be an exact replica of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France, but this one at Kings Island was only a third the size. It had three elevators that went up the center of the structure, and the elevators would stop at a 50-foot platform and a 275-foot platform where guests could look out and have a great view of the park. While today, the only way to access these two viewing platforms is through these elevators, at the time John was at the park in 1983, the park actually had a flight of stairs that went from the ground all the way to the the very top of the tower oh, that went no. right up the middle of the structure and the public was allowed to take these stairs all the way up to the first platform that 50 foot platform and while the stairs did actually continue beyond that up to the 275 foot platform the public was not allowed to go any 
higher on the stairs than that first platform. And so if you took these stairs, once you got to the 50 foot platform, there would be a big fence right on the stairwell preventing you from going any farther. And it says authorized personnel only, don't go any farther. And so the only people that would walk up those additional flights of stairs were staff that had a special key. When John stumbled his way over to the base of this replica tower, he did not get on an elevator. Instead, he took the stairs. So he made his way up to the 50 foot platform. And then when he got to the six foot tall gate preventing him from going any farther, he just climbed up and over it and continued walking up the stairs and nobody stopped him. He finally came to a stop just below the 275 foot mark. And so he's on the stairwell. And at this point he turns and faces the inside of the tower. It's all these metal beams all over the place and he climbs over the railing of the stairs he's on and he climbs onto this narrow beam that's actually a part of the support structure of this tower and he grabs onto the beam above him and just begins walking along this beam towards the center of the tower where the three elevator shafts are. <clears throat> now, there's no safety net on either side of John, so if he slips and falls, he's falling hundreds of feet to the ground. And if he keeps walking and actually gets into the elevator shaft, there's nothing protecting him from being struck by one of the elevators because the people who built this tower were not thinking about people walking on these exposed beams hundreds of feet up into the air. This right. is a totally dangerous and unauthorized area. But John just continues shimmying across this beam until he does get to the middle of the tower and now he's literally standing looking down into the elevator shafts. And as he's most likely looking around admiring where he was, one of the elevator cars below him began to start moving. To understand what happens next, you need to have a rudimentary understanding of how this elevator worked. A large metal rope was attached to the top of the elevator car and from there it was thread up the elevator shaft all the way to the top where it was fed through a pulley that was anchored to the ceiling and then that rope was fed right back down the shaft to the bottom where it was attached to a counterweight. A counterweight is just a large heavy weight that's designed to balance this elevator car on this pulley system. Without the weight the elevator car would just slip off of that pulley. Sure. And so any time the elevator car moved up, the counterweight would move down and vice versa, making sure that car was always balanced. And so John is standing right on the edge of this elevator shaft, presumably just kind of looking around, admiring where he was, when down below him, that elevator car starts to move and it starts to actually descend away from John. And so the car itself is not necessarily a threat to John. However, its counterweight is because if the car is going down, its counterweight is going up and it's right in the path of John. And so as John is leaning out over the shaft looking around, this counterweight comes screaming up and picks him off of the beam he's on and carries him up into the shaft. Mm. The impact on John was so strong that it's believed he was actually impaled on some of the exposed metal wiring on top of this counterweight and he got totally tangled up in all of the cables on top of there. And so as John is desperately trying to free himself, the elevator operator, there was always a staff member inside of these elevator cars, he actually noticed when John got stuck on the counterweight. But of course, this worker would have no idea that's what it was. They would later recall, it just felt like the car suddenly jumped. And so this worker, fearing that something had gone wrong with the elevator car itself, he decided he would ride it all the way to the bottom, let everybody get out, and then ride back up to the top, totally empty, to make sure that the car actually worked before allowing people back on. And so the worker went to the ground, everybody got out, he closed the doors, he began his ascent, he got to that first platform at 50 feet, no issues, he got about 10 feet above that first platform, so at about 60 feet, when all of a sudden he hears an unbelievably loud thud on the roof of his elevator car, causing his car to immediately come to a stop. And then blood began pouring over oh, the sides no. of the car over the windows. After getting stuck on the counterweight, John probably did everything he could to try to free himself, but he just couldn't do it. However, when that elevator worker decided to go back up again to test the capacity of the elevator car, it reversed the direction of the counterweight weight that John was stuck on. And so as that car was going up, John began going down and it was on this descent that parts of John's body must have been dangling off of this counterweight and they must have struck one of the beams as he was going down and that beam effectively pried him off of whatever he was stuck on and threw him over the edge into the center of the shaft. 
and so John would fall 200 feet and he would land on top of that elevator car, dying instantly. Oh, the park was very quick God. to block off the ride and the whole scene and got police involved very quickly. So only a very small number of guests and employees were aware an accident had even happened. And very few of them were aware that it had been a fatal accident. As oh, for the police, my. they knew they had a dead body, but they had no way to identify the body. There was no ID cards on John, and so they had no way to let his friends know that were in the park or to tell his family. And so it wasn't until that night when John's friends are out in the parking lot waiting for John to come out again that they got really worried and they went up and spoke to a security guard at the Dang. front of the park. And that security guard, after hearing their story, would tell them that actually there had been an accident in the park and there was a body and the police are still trying to identify this body. And so maybe you guys want to go over to the hospital and see if it's your friend. And so sure enough, the friends went to the hospital and they would confirm that the body was John Harder. To this day, no one knows for sure why John did what he did. Some say he was just drunk and it was a dumb decision that led to his death. True. Others say he was suicidal, but many of the people that were close to him mm. say, no way, he was not suicidal. And other people say, no. you know, John, he loved attention. And so perhaps this was a dangerous stunt gone too far. But regardless of his reasons, John had clearly intentionally entered an area that was off limits and it got him killed. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found bro. the secret in today's episode, oh, let us know in the comment section what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comment section. Dang, that sucks, man. That really does sucks. <sighs> Unfortunate, really. All right, all right, all right. That was Mr. Ballin. Top three places you can go and people went anyways. Part 25. Dang, that sucks. That really sucks because he looked like a good kid. And, well, you know, alcohol, man. Alcohol, brother. It's one of the worst drugs in the world. It really is, man. It really, really is. But, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for the love. If you guys have any other requests, please leave it down in the comment section. I always welcome it. Other than that, guys, if you guys want to keep in touch with your boy, you can find me on my social medias right over here. Bam. Um, but, yeah, other than that, guys, thank you so much. Truly appreciate you. And as always, stay gifted, stay true. Peace. Perfect.